Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Healing and Freedom Journey. Mark DeJesus here. I am your brother from another mother, bringing you insights along the way. I am all about mental, emotional, and relationship health, and if you are too, you have arrived at a great place. Today, I want to take you on a journey, and this journey is going to involve me going line by line through some scriptures to walk you through what it can be like to get set free from a life filled with condemnation and struggle that keeps you in condemnation and into the beauty of God's grace and what that looks like. And I'm going to center that in Romans 7. We're going to go line by line and we're going to navigate through Paul's expression here. We're going to break down some words. We're going to look at this because I know for some of these scriptures, it can be challenging for people to navigate through and understand, but there's great power if we just pause and break things down and look at them and get God's heart on this, because many people can get lost in terms and they can get lost in confusion, and many are condemned as they're reading the scriptures. And you'll see in my previous uh, broadcast that I did in this grace series about really understanding condemnation and allowing our minds to, to discern it because many of us are realizing, myself included, a lot of what we attribute to God and what we sense God is saying is actually the influence of condemnation, including shame, toxic guilt, accusation. These forces of thought seek to steal the freedom that Jesus Christ paid for, and that you are actually able to live in. But unfortunately, a lot of Christian teaching is infused with aspects that empower condemnation and keep believers in bondage. There is so much more freedom in Christ than we could ever imagine, but still we are pushing and driving believers back into a form of slavery that's not allowing them to see the greater freedom that is available. And so the more that I've seen this in my life, the more that I just want to share the beauty of what this is. Now, two books in my life that have been very impactful for my healing and freedom journey has been the book of Romans and the book of Galatians. The book of Romans has brought about such an illumination of the love of the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians has taken that to a next level, and I do hope along the way that I will be able to provide Bible study kind of material and broadcast and so forth in, in that kind of audio-video format, maybe with outlines and things, where we could walk through the Scriptures. And quite possibly, this could be an example of what that could look like. But my intent here today is to take you on a journey from condemnation to grace. It's a, it's a beautiful journey, but it's layer by layer. It takes time because we're going to need to experience some renewal in areas of our life, because there's ways of thinking, ways of even certain terms and terminology that keep us bound to aspects that keep condemning us, keep us bound under law, and actually keep us in unproductive sin cycles that we just stay stuck in. Relig religiosity, law, performance-driven Christianity, perfectionism, but yet we kind of don't know any other way. So what I appreciate about Paul here in Romans 7 is his honesty and his transparent expression of the journey that he went through. And he's, taken the, he's taking the Romans here through the process of understanding here. So without further ado, let me pull up these scriptures here. And we'll look here. I'll start with Romans 7. Now, I could go back to 6. There's so much here. He talks about sin and being set free from sin, and he brings the the being bound to something, being bound to sin, and then now being bound to Christ and what we are as servants of Christ. Let me start here with Romans 7, and I'll go line by line here to walk you through. This is something maybe you want to take notes on, maybe something you want to pull out your own Bible and let yourself. I, I typically use the New King James as a place of teaching. Uh, I know that other translations can be helpful in this process as well, but that's where I'm going to come from. So Paul here is talking about a process 
of moving from condemnation into grace and the beauty of righteousness found in Christ Jesus. And he starts off by bringing a metaphor of marriage. And what happens when you are tied to something that it keeps you bound to relationship with that. Okay, so he says in in verse, uh, I'll read one through four. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law. So his audience here that he's speaking to, most likely the majority of the audience are believers, but they are aware of the law. And so he is bringing out, okay, you understand this? There's some things I'm going to bring out. So he says that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. So a big theme in Romans 8, and what we're going to see here that's going to lead us to freedom, is there's there's some things we have to die to, and many people go, oh no, what is this going to mean? Because when Christians hear, you got to die to this, it's often misrepresented in what that actually means and what that looks like, from my perspective. But he's going to talk about this process of dying to an old system that keeps us actually bound in performance and perfectionism, and then it manifests sin, and then we're condemned, and it repeats over and over again. So he brings a marriage analogy into the picture. The law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Verse number two, for the woman who has a husband and is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, but if the husband dies, she is released from the law of the hus- of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. So now, Paul is making an analogy of our relationship with the law to an analogy of marriage. He says in verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you have become dead to the law, through the body of Christ. So by saying yes to Jesus Christ, we're going through this process where we're coming alive to Jesus and we're dead to the law here, that you may be married to another. So one has to die so I can get married to another. To him was raised from the dead that we should bear fruit to God. Because one of the problems with the law is it doesn't bear eternal fruit. It actually leads to condemnation. It actually leads to sin being aroused. So we stay stuck in sin. So so Paul's making a marriage analogy here, that in marriage you're bound to another person, right? Till death do us part. So if you're married and you go marry someone else, it's adultery because you're under the law of your marriage bond, right? Now, don't get lost in this passage because many people will write to me or say to me uh, they've been divorced. They've been the, divorce and remarriage is a whole different topic here. So we don't want to spin out because many people are already spiraling out. I've been divorced, this and that. Okay, that's not the point of this passage. The point Paul is bringing out is you can't be married to the law and experience freedom in Christ. How many believers are following Christ? but you're still trying to be married to the law. Now, you may say, I, I, don't, I don't give animal sacrifices. I don't follow each line of the law. But we see it in the form of modern perfectionism and performance-based living. And the Bible says that the work of the law is such a virus that you can't just take a little of the law you can't go, oh, I don't use a little bit of this, use a little bit of that. When the law has influence, you got to obey the whole thing. So this thing, we have to realize we can't negotiate with it. We can't debate with it. We actually have to die to the law as our way of living in trying to follow God. This is a first and foremost here. At the top of the list, the solution to the law is not trying to overcome on the law's terms. And many of you are actually trying to overcome according to law terms. And two big ones are performance-driven living to try to do, 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 do to please God that hopefully someday I will get in good graces. You know, it's a saying that we say, no, that's not grace, trying to do better. 
and try to be better. And the second is perfectionism. Just right, but never enough. Just right, but never enough. Man, I got to get this right. And what we don't what we don't realize is living that way actually empowers condemnation. Because the law comes to you and brings a standard of holiness. You try to follow it. You can't. You fail. Condemnation hits you. Then you, in your condemnation, you try to do better. I'm going to try to do better, try to do better. And this is the cycle that many of us live in. I lived most of my life, and it wasn't really, to be honest, it wasn't until my 30s of living this way my whole life that I began to start going, there's something here that I've never been taught, and I've heard sermons over and over again. Why are we still bound? Why are Christians still under these yokes? Why are still believers living under constant chronic condemnation? And their mental health is, is, is eroding underneath the weight of that torment. It's because we have not allowed ourselves, and, and especially those who've, who've taught it, many who are teaching are still under performance and perfectionism and how they relate to God. So they're, they're infecting their congregations with that leaven. And then they're reproducing that in people they're talking to. Okay, So the solution is not serving Christ while trying to hold on to the mindset of the law. I've got to die to that. I've got to die to trying to please God with my performance. I've got to die to trying to do everything just right but never enough. I have to die to those perfectionistic standards. I have to actually let that go. Okay? So, now the key hold that the law has on you is found in verse number 5. I got it here. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Because he says, now, we, we need to bear fruit to God, which is life, but we're, we're bearing fruit to death. Okay, let me break this down. The law's basis is thou shalt not. That's what it brings. And so it brings an awareness of sin. That's what the law did. It made us aware of all this bondage, all this sinful stuff. And so because of it, when you say thou shalt not, it actually arouses sin to now happen. Let me give you an example. If I was to tell you, thinking and doing anything that has to do with the color red is evil. Don't think about or dwell on or focus on or do anything that involves red. Don't think about red. Don't think about red. Now, that's problematic for two reasons. Number one, there's red all over my shirt <laughs> for those of you watching this video. Secondly, the fact that I brought up don't do it, it now ignites it. So now you're seeing everything in the screen that's red and you're paying attention to everything that's red. Because you're high, and you and many of us operate with this as a primary reference. Don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, to the point that we become obsessive, right? And what happens? A compulsion comes in, and then we end up going, oh, now I've now I've done it, now I've thought about it. And then what happens? We condemn ourselves. Okay? So that's the primary mechanism of the law. Now, many will say, well, Mark, if I get free from that, that means I'm going to be lawless. I'm going to be way on the other side. That actually reveals how much you've been under the influence of the law. It, it, it infuses more of that black and white thinking. It doesn't let you see grace. It doesn't let you see relationship. It doesn't let you see process and journey. It's like my only option from this is another problem. And God is not presenting to us choose law-based living or lawless and do whatever you want. God is not presenting those options. But we in our bondage can only see things through that kind of lens. So we think getting free from one is then going to lead us into another. How about we actually see the option of grace instead of looking at the ditches? As I always say, why do we need to drive in the ditches? Why, If I stare at the ditches, I often end in it. I end up in it, right? I'm driving along the road and I'm staring at a ditch as I'm driving along the road. I'm going to tend to steer towards it. Why? Because that's where my focus is. Why don't I just get on the road? The road is the journey 
of grace. But God is saying there's a whole different way of relating because there's an old system at work that wants to keep the law and keep this sin pattern alive in your life. And Paul says, when we were in the flesh. Now, growing up in church, the term flesh is often very confusing. People say, I'm in the flesh. You're just doing that in the flesh. We got to stop doing this in the flesh. It's a term that's thrown around a lot, and it lacks context because there's about 14 or 15 different definitions of what this word flesh means. The word flesh here, it can mean human existence, you know, flesh and blood. It can mean some meat you had for dinner. It can mean all of mankind, for I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. It can speak of weaker sides of humanity, just human limitations, right? There can be a contrast between flesh and spirit. We can talk about outward versus the inward. Don't just look at somebody according to the flesh. It can mean like just the outward of what you see. We, whenever you read the flesh, we need to understand context. What is it speaking of? And one of the aspects that I want to bring out as far as the flesh is concerned here is an understanding of the flesh being the old you. This is the old you bound under sin, but tied to the law as a way of living. Let this sink in for a moment. The old you tied to the law as a way of living. Because he says here, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions were aroused by the law. So flesh, old you, tied to the old way, the law, which then brings about sin. Old you, law, sin. Old you, law, sin. Condemnation. Got it? You see the four-step plan? The old you, seeks to follow the law. The law brings about sin, so we end up sinning. Then, in the sin, we're condemned. What do we do? We repeat back to the beginning. We live in the old you. The old you is doing what? Trying to find, when we talk about the flesh here, the flesh isn't just uh, what, we would, what we would say straight up sin, like, like all the list of sins we could come up with. The flesh is the old you that attempts to walk in righteousness according to law, which involves performance-driven living, your effort to do better, do better, do better, and perfectionism, right? And then you hope your good outweighs your bad, and maybe God will be happy with me, and then, well, these really bad things, but I, but I do these. And in the end, it leads to two pathways. The flesh and the law lead to two pathways. And they are, one is a condemnation cycle that you stay in, or two, you get into a delusion that you've arrived somewhere. Maybe you get a position in church. This is what happens to leaders that are full of law. You get a position and you start to exude self-righteousness. Now you start condemning others and you start getting angry and yelling at everybody and telling them where they need to get right and you want to win arguments. And this is where a lot of preachers manifest this. They're infused with law. Because they're not manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. They're not patient with people. They're not manifesting love, joy, and peace. They're manifesting, I'm right, you're wrong, shame on you, condemnation, get it right, I won the argument, there you go. And then they get people around them that go, yeah, stick it to them. We really have a problem where we're not manifesting the fruit of the Spirit, because that's Christian maturity. But it goes back to the cycle, we're still living influenced by the old me. The old me wants to defend myself. The old me wants to get propped up. In psychology, they may call some of that the ego. In psychology, they may call that, you know, you're getting in, you're getting in your, 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 uh, your ego. Or you're, sometimes it's brought up by saying the false you. And in biblical terms, we can talk about this as the flesh. It's the old you trying to survive, trying to defend oneself, have a reputation, have a stance of righteousness in this world before God. So if we were to say, are you right with God today? You would scan to see, are you sinless? Do you have nothing that you can see? And some people go, yes, there's nothing there. And they prop themselves up. Others go, oh my goodness, it's everywhere. And they crumble. 
Where do you end up finding? Or maybe you bounce between the two. So the solution the Bible gives is you don't fight this, you don't argue with this, you die to it completely. This is why just coming to the end of yourself, learning to let go, to no longer compulsively trying to live by this four-step process of death, old you, followed by the law, rules and regulations, performance-driven perfectionism, which ends up arousing sin, sin manifests, and then I'm condemned in it. And then in my condemnation, I panic and try to repeat, and I go back to over again. Or I end up living a self-righteous standing to begin with. When Jesus ministered, who was the group of people he was the hardest on? I mean, this is the group that got him angry. It was the self-righteous elite leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the people who were workers of the law. And so what they did too, it's understandable living by the law, what they did is they came in and added extra burdens, postured themselves in a picture of self-righteousness, and talked down to the people, burdened them, instead of leading them in anticipation of grace and making way for grace. Grace showed up right in front of their face, and they couldn't see it, receive it. In fact, they crucified it. And I believe that is still at work in the body of Christ today. Because law helps us maintain a sense of control. It helps us maintain a sense of our rules. Here's the box. Keep people in it. You don't follow this box. And then they say, well, well, you're teaching this whatever and go ahead and sin and sloppiness, right? That's another form of deception. When you teach grace, people go, well, what about sloppy grace, right? That becomes a knee-jerk reaction. It becomes another round of diluting the beauty of grace that actually has the power to set us free from sin and gives us freedom to live and move and have our being and get out of the shackles of slavery that so many people are living in today. So again, we're going back to this is the old you. And, and, and this is where sin gains its leverage, where the body of sin gains leverage is in the flesh, in the old you, and it's through the law. The old you has connection to the law, and that's how it keeps itself alive. The flesh drives humanity to find their existence and purpose apart from the work of Christ. It points back to the law, or it points back to you. It points back to your works, how well you're doing. Uh, do you, have you got your devotions right? Did you read your Bible today? Did you get those things? Checkbox, checkbox, checkbox. You're constantly checking off the box. This is the old you. The flesh that wants to justify itself in a sense of goodness based on good works and intentions. That's why Paul's, you know, Paul's saying we got to crucify the flesh because this is what is going to lead us into this cycle. We hear crucify the flesh as crucify those bad things. God, crucify those bad things I'm doing. Crucify those bad things. If we go over it now, bear with me. Let me go over to Galatians for just a moment. I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm not going to do too much bouncing to other passages of Scripture because I want to stay focused here. But this is, this, is, this is where I focus on Christian maturity because Paul says the works of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and of the like, which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, those who practice such things, he's speaking about those who practice this as a way of life, and they say it's acceptable, they they even promote it for other people to do it, and they... they uh, contaminate other people with this, such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What we often look at as crucifying the flesh, because he says in verse 24 down there, those who are of Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is the way that we typically think of it. All those bad things, don't do it, crucify it. I crucify drunkenness, I crucify murders, I crucify outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, I crucify it. No, you're crucifying yourself to the old you, which followed the law. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. I'm a good boy. I do good things. I'm a good guy. I do these great things. I, I follow God. I do my devotions. It leads to these things happening. 
The flesh tries to achieve righteousness apart from Christ, and it leads to just performance, religious law, and this stuff ends up happening. These things are the absence of the fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What does he say here in the next sentence? Against such there is no law. The law is powerless against the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is relational. You can't experience the fruit of the Spirit without being connected to the Spirit. And I'm not connected to the Spirit because I'm a good boy and I prayed and I did all these things just right. It's by God's grace I said yes and received that sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross and resurrection. And I come alive to the love that God has for me in where I'm at. He calls me righteous because of what Jesus Christ did for me. So I stand before my Father freely. Now I get to relate to him because the fruit of the Spirit is all relational. It's all relational. That's why I keep directing believers. You want to, you want to manifest spiritual maturity? Let me see how you handle relationships. That's where you need to grow. That's where you need to grow. That's where God's doing his healing, maturing work is in these areas. We make spiritual maturity, your position in the church, how much Bible you know, how much you can recite, how much you can win arguments or debates, uh, prestige, money, influence. We make it a lot of things. It's not. In fact, um, if you want to, you know, if you, if you wanted to look and go, what, how should somebody's life be evaluated? Let's look at the fruit in their life outside of the stage, outside of public arena. That's where the fruit really is. We're always looking to, as fruit being how somebody is on the platform. In fact, this is a whole tangent in itself, but sometimes we look at people that have um, falling outs. Maybe their ministry has a fallout or something. And we go, wait, they had so much fruit. Because our definition of fruit is ministry achievements. When really... Fruit is how you live your life day-to-day -day with people and really behind the closed doors in your real life, not in what's performed and presented. Because this kind of stuff, you can't perform this. This is learned. I got to learn how to live in love. I got to learn how to live in joy. I got to practice peace. And when I'm carrying that relationally, God shows up in people's lives. Now, these areas here, all this stuff here, works of the flesh, this is what happens to people that are trying to follow God by obeying all the rules, performance and perfectionism. These things are the absence of the fruit of the Spirit. Because adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, all those things are healed in the first one, love. Love. Joy comes in. Now fulfillment in that joy. Peace settles in us. Now we're satisfied. We're satisfied by God. We're experiencing connection with him. That's why a, a, all sexual sin is a, is a disconnect to the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And we focus, we try to fight sexual bondage with more law. Get your, get your filters up. Do these 10 things. Do these, and it works for a little bit. And then it dies out, and then you're back in the bondage again, because you never get to the heart of the matter. Because law-based teaching and living produces a temporary seeming fix, but doesn't produce long-term change. And it doesn't allow you to get to the heart of what's really going on. So, for example, if you have a pornography addiction, you go, oh, it's because I don't read my Bible enough. It's because you, the, the, the condemning quick answers always point to your performance. Do you notice that? Perform, oh, you're dirty, filthy, rotten. It shames you and it and it accuses you about your performance. So you try to fix your performance. Doesn't heal it because you don't get to the heart of it. Condemnation blocks you from getting to the heart of your battle. And so these things reveal. So we get into idolatry, sorcery. That is now, now it's the, the work of the flesh and law and performance. We're getting distracted now from the beauty of Christ, and getting into all these other pathways to make ourselves try to get peace, try to be better. And then you just see a whole list of relationship breakdown. 
hatred, contentions, jealousies, wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunk. It's just the Wild West is happening. But it doesn't start with people going, I'm going to be evil. No. Nope. No one starts off that way. We start off in the flesh, the old us. When I say yes to Christ as a new me, that opens up, right? Coming alive into God. The old me, which then tries to in the law, I'm going to be a good person. And that's a prevalent mindset. I live in the United States. That's a prevalent mindset in America. I'm a good person. I haven't murdered anyone. I pay my taxes. I do nice things for people. That's flesh talk. That's old you talk. That's, that's, that's how I feel good about myself. I do those things. Paul says, die to all that. Paul, even to the point, looked at all his, all his, um, his accomplishments in Pharisaical leadership. And he goes, eh, he's just... And then he even looked, he looked further at, at, at a lot of things he could prop up. He's like, yes. He's like, ah, it's just, I, it's, I, I don't, that's, that doesn't prop me up. What, what, what I stand on is the excellence and beauty of Jesus Christ. So this is all relationship breakdown. This is why the church is filled with all this and divisions and all this stuff. And, what we're missing is the fruit of the Spirit. You can't teach the fruit of the Spirit under law. You just can't. And the modern church has so much law influence of perfectionism and performance because this stuff is messy. If you learn how to love people, you move towards messiness rather than just yelling at people, judging them, and condemning them away. If you want to teach people the fruit of the Spirit, you have to learn joy. And many of our church services are the most joyless places on the planet. How did that happen? The work of the law came in, took over, just like in the Galatian church. And Paul said, how'd you let this happen? The fruit of the Spirit is going to bring peace to people's lives rather than keeping them in anxiety. The problem is, is that a lot of our preaching keeps people in anxiety because anxiety gets them to do stuff. So if I yell at you, if you were to die right now and God came in his absolute holiness and stared at you in your sin, what would you say? Oh, in our fear, we respond. We lose our peace and... Uh, the law-based words that somebody came kicked us up. See, this stuff actually sets your people free to live and move and have their being. Who well, I'm talking to can move people in the body of Christ to greater freedom. So let me go, let me go back to let me go back to where I was here. If you give me just a second, I think if I click this, I'm back. Um, So this is why the flesh has to be crucified. I'm dying to performance and perfectionism, to put it in modern terminology. And I want to define this crucifying the flesh, dying to the flesh, dying to the old you that has to perform for God's love, or quite frankly, to perform for love for anybody. And number two is dying to that perfectionistic pressure. That's why I teach so much on those two concepts. They are the deceptions that are within the body of Christ. Die to trying to make yourself better before God. Many people see dying to the flesh as like, I got to do a bunch of these sacrificial things to make God happy. Or I got I got I got I got to give up this 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 and this and this and that's dying. I got to and all you're doing is just yelling at yourself. And you're just more hateful, more angry. Look at the fruit of it. And I hope you get what I'm bringing out here is what I'm encouraging into is, and this is the first key on the journey, moving from condemnation into grace, dying to the old you that's tied to the law. You died. I'm going to let go today. Maybe you just pray that right now. God, I, I'm going to, I let go. I'm trying to be righteous, trying to get you to love me by my performance, my just right living perfectionism and all that law stuff. I'm going to say yes to the love you have for me. Thank you for your grace. Jesus Christ made me righteous right now. And I stand before the Father, and I can freely talk to my Father because of Jesus. I say yes to it by faith, not because I feel it completely or because I've got it all figured out. I say yes to it by faith. I'm, I'm dead to that old stuff. 
I'm dead to the old religious way of trying to make my Father in Heaven happy. And a lot of that goes back to our childhood. and How you try to make your parents happy and how you try to, and you exhaust yourself in this. So, just getting started here. Like I said, I'm taking a journey. In verse 6, but now... We have been delivered from the law, having, dying to, having died to what we were held by. So you see where this dying is? It's dying to the old system. So that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not the oldness of the letter. And so this is the newness of the Spirit. Do you, do you sense that refreshing? Like I, I, just, I get to live out of response to the love that God's given me, out of response to what Jesus did the Spirit now empowers me because I'm not bogged down with all this condemnation of all these areas and where I fall short. That's not even the scale what we're dealing with anymore. This is so amazing. I'm so grateful for this, God, this freedom. And he says the newness of the Spirit, not the oldness of the letter. The letter here is an important statement to notice because in other passages, Paul says the letter kills Again, that's that influence of law. The Spirit gives life. So even when you're reading the Bible, is it leading you to life or is it leading you to death and keeping you stuck there? And many teachers would say, well, you're feeling death because you're not living right and you're not doing all these things. Hmm. Let's look at that. Let's look at that because we're getting people back into performance-driven Christianity again. The letter kills because it's the letter of the law. It's looking at things through law-based mindset. The Spirit gives life. That's why two people can read the Bible and come to two totally different conclusions, one infused by the law, one infused by the Spirit. When you're infused by the law, there's a couple manifestations of that. The letter of the law is you see uh, you're, li- you're left disempowered, you're left condemned, you spiral in fear with no freedom, you, um, you have confusion, you have discouragement, you have... Um, uh, shame, you have uh, dread, all those, that punishment sense, that's what that produces. Because the law tries to get into the scriptures to then create constant rejection. And so you come out with not grace, but disempowerment. The Spirit gives life because God knows how to meet you where you're at and bring you to life so that you, there's no way you could go, well, I did this and this and this, and doggone it, it set me free. You go, this is, this is Jesus. This is the beauty of who he is, the radiance of his glory. The Spirit brings newness from, from the bondage of sin, from obsessing over sin, from being condemned over sin, but freedom to live and move and have your being. Freedom to walk forward, knowing that your righteousness has been paid, and now you grow in that righteousness. So what happens is that you grow in connecting to what you already have, instead of trying to go out there and find it. It's already at work within me. So the way that this works is when I say yes to Christ, I spend the rest of my life discovering what I said yes to. Many people, in their dis- they don't let the room for discovery happen. They expect themselves to get it all down. <laughs> and it creates this impossible standard, and that's influenced by the law. It's like they're trying to get saved by the influence of the law. No wonder it's confusing. So then this creates two patterns that I see in the church. One pattern is your salvation is probably invalid. And that's sending more and more people to absolute mental illness. And we've got to, we, churches, we need, to, we need to really get aware of this because we are putting people in bondage by, because of what we see in their life, we're invalidating their salvation rather than teaching them and working on their discovery of the beauty of what they said yes to. Or you have another camp that goes, well, you lost it. You lost it. You had that salvation and now you lost it as though it's a, a piece of ice that just slips out of their fingers. When I was a kid, I was sitting in a boat with my dad, and we were going out. I want to say it was a, it was a saltwater lake or lake or or one of the that was connected to the or something, it, or maybe it's just a big lake. Anyway, we were on the boat and we were at the dock, and they were getting all our 
lines ready, and I had my fishing pole, and I was sitting there, bored kid, waiting for waiting for the guys to get all their stuff ready. So I took my rod, and it had bait. My dad set me up with bait, and I just let the bait just go into the water. As I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, <laughs> it's just, oh my goodness, I'm pulling with all my might. My dad looks over, and sees I caught something just sitting there at the dock, having in the boat, tied to the dock. They hadn't let off yet in the water. My dad helps me, pulls it out, and it's an eel. This long eel. And I'll never forget it. It's just kind of, my dad just kind of went into action. And he just grabbed that eel and he's going like this. <laughs> Finally, he gets it unhooked. And for some reason, I have that metaphor, that analogy in my mind with many believers over their salvation. This, like this. Like this eel that's just <laughs> as those that's the salvation is this just this you have to try with everything you've got rather than releasing your faculties to the beauty of grace. And the reason that we don't we struggle is we don't we don't know unconditional love and what that looks like. And performance-driven, perfectionistic Christianity is afraid of unconditional love. So much so they go, well, God hates sin. We've got to be careful. We don't compromise. There we go. It's, it's like this defense mechanism to not go there. Because, you see, when I receive unconditional love, I start to see the areas of brokenness in my life. I start dealing with stuff because there's no shame in Jesus Christ. And now I can really get to why I do the stuff that I do and why I don't do the stuff that I don't want to do and all that that we're going to get into in just a few moments. So in, in by the Spirit, getting back, to, getting back to where we are here in context, you grow in connecting to what you already have instead of trying to go out there and get it. But Paul wants us to, to put, he, want, um, he wants to put the law in perspective. Okay, that it was a tutor, it was a start, but it's not the final. I'm not a big fan of how people add in these these headings, but it's it's there. So I wish there's a way I could just get it out so it'd just be verse, 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 verse. But that's just the way that it is. So let's go to verse seven. He says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Because he said that's what it could lead you to. It could lead you to go, well, the law manifests sin, so therefore the law is sinful. He's like, no, it's not. What he's going to bring out is it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a lesser covenant. It was incomplete in what it was able to provide. It pointed to something greater. And so Paul said, no, on the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. So he's like, I'm grateful that I was aware of God's holiness, aware of sin. He said, I would have not have known covetousness. Until the law said, you shall not covet. It made him aware of that in his life. The point of the law is to show us what sin was, but also to show us we needed something greater because the law couldn't set us free from sin. It couldn't provide. So it, it, it pointed to a greater, which is why in all the prophets and the Old Testament, you see this longing for the greater to set us free from these shackles, the structure that's put in place that couldn't produce life. We need Messiah, okay? The law awakened awareness of sin, but then sin manifested and brought all kinds of problems. As he says here, sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. From apart from the law, sin was dead. Interesting. The thou shalt not really brought out an awakening for sin because it knew you wouldn't be able to resist it. You wouldn't be able to stand against it, and you would try to do it in your own righteousness. Notice here, uh, sin took the opportunity with the presence of the commandment or the law. Sin gains leverage with the law. If you ask people, how does sin manifest? What's the primary way sin manifests? Because we're bad people born into sin. Okay, sure. But is our people teaching? You, you, you have sin in your life because you're trying to be a good Christian. 
<laughs> no one's teaching that. Oh, pastor, I'm struggling with, with sin in my life. Yeah, because you're trying to be a good Christian. <laughs> Why don't you let go of that? Just stop trying to trying to do that. Be good. You're loved right now where you're at. Wait, no. Hey. Anyways. Wait, wait. If I, grace, does that mean, that mean I should go sin? And Paul covered this. He covered this twice. Shall we sin more that grace shall abound? No, he's, he, he's addressing all the black and white thinkers that hear about this grace and go OCD on, does that mean I'm going to be lawless and I'm going to sin more? He says, certainly not. So even Paul was addressing the black and white thinkers. <laughs> I want to bring that up. He says, I was, I was alive once without the law. It's an interesting statement. Don't ask me to ex- explain that fully. It is a interesting. What does that mean? You know, what does that mean in timeline in your journey? Um, I was alive without the law, but when the commandment came in, sin revived, and I died. I mean, it was producing death in his life. So the law brings about an awareness of sin with no solution. So what happens? Death, erosion starts to take place. And the commandment, he says, in verse 10, which was in the commandment, speaking of the law, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. That's what the law does. It brings an offer to life, but it doesn't. Erosion happens. So then in verse 11, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. So sin is using the law as a front. <laughs> it's an interesting kind of game. Some of this, I know, it can almost get a little Dr. Seuss, like this, this, and this word, this word. So I'm trying to uh, be as clear as I can of these distinctions. Sin's going, it's kind of hiding behind law. And it does it today in law, performance perfectionism. It hides behind it, keeps you in it, and then you fall into that pattern, and then what happens? You keep sinning. Sin is empowered by law-based thinking and living. So the church goes, we need to get right with God. The solution is we got to pray harder. We got to serve harder. We got to do more. So what happens? Some of those people become self-righteous, and they look like they're holy, and their sins are just more hidden. Then there's others that are just struggling and struggling and struggling. They seem they're unspiritual, and then we just go, oh, you're just in the flesh. Because we've not taught them the flesh is the old them that gets power from the law. Are we setting our children, uh, brothers and sisters, children of God, free by getting them out of performance-based living? Therefore, he says in verse 12, the law is holy, meaning that what the law do, the law brought about Sin, it showed you sin, and it showed this absolute holiness of God that's unattainable under the law. Okay? The commandment, holy and just and good. The law brings holiness in no way for you to experience it or to gain freedom. Okay? So let me skip past that heading here and go to verse 13. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. See how, like, there is... Paul does a couple things. He kind of uses wordings that go back and forth. You kind of have to go, wait, you have to slow down. And and then in other passages, he writes like a, in Ephesians, he writes a lot of run, a run on sentences that you have to take a, you have to take a few breaths as you're reading it. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good. Again, it's got the law here as like a cover. It's using it as that that's why when Jesus talked to the Pharisees he says you're, you're whitewashed you got this cover going on but behind it is is a work of sin it's a religious front that's going on but it's producing death through this front okay cuz the the enemy sin doesn't just show up and go hey want to murder people want to have sex everywhere it's not what it does it doesn't start off that way Starts off with I'm a good person and I do good things and uh, because of that that's why we got to let go of that like trying to like I'm trying to be good I'm trying to make God happy. It was producing uh, uh, it was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly 
sinful. The law is not sin, but the law was inadequate, and it became a cover for sin to work, because we would, thou shalt not, and performance perfectionism. And so he says the law, we know the law is spiritual. It brings about a spiritual grid. But he realized, I'm I'm carnal. I'm sold under sin. Okay, we can look at that word carnal. Um but in body, temporal, animal, unregenerate. It can mean of, of, of the nature of the flesh, right? Sometimes carnal flesh can be used, governed by mere human nature, not the Spirit of God, having its seat in the animal nature, aroused by the animal nature, human, with the included idea of depravity, okay? Uh, pertaining to the flesh, to the body. So those, those, are, those are a couple things here that kind of bring word to that carnal, uh, a sense of life without God, uh, more in just earthly existence without a spiritual lens, okay? That's kind of, when I, when I think of carnal, it's earthly existence without a spiritual lens, because he says here, and it fits in the context, he says the law is spiritual, and he's like, I'm carnal. The, 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 and the flesh will do that too. The flesh seeks to, the old you, seeks to find righteousness on your own, and it, it it just keeps things in natural world and does and forgets we're in a spiritual battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Okay, there's that term flesh being used here, the spiritual lens. Okay, so you get that. Hopefully that helps you a little bit. Sold under sin. Now, we're about to get super honest here. The Apostle Paul, who is written, inspired word of God, is about to get really, really honest. He says, for what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I want to do, that I do not practice. What I hate, that I do. Now, I think if Paul preached today, he'd probably get kicked out of a lot of churches and be called a false prophet or be called, a, I don't know, disqualified or something, right? A lot of, can you relate to this, though? That statement should give a lot of people a sigh of relief, Paul the Apostle here saw the third heavens. He's written scriptures. He's, you know, helped uh, in the founding of the of what we know as the church. I want to get, when I go to heaven, somewhere in the long line, I want to give Paul a giant hug in heaven for what he wrote here and appreciate that. Now, many people debate. Here's a, here's a common debate. Is this Paul before he was a believer or not? And so we get lost in in that. But I don't know. He's speaking about it in present tense. I believe what he's speaking is the transition. He says yes to Christ, but there's a time where Paul was apart. He was away as he was, as he was, yes, he ministered, but there was a lot of time where he was away. And I believe he's processing his journey of what he said yes to, and he this encounter he had with Jesus. He, I believe he had to detox law. He had to work this stuff and see the beauty of Jesus Christ as he then began writing these letters and establishing the believers in fundamental truth. Okay? We don't see a lot of things in process. So it's either, you know, it's either, it's either, no, he was, he was teaching that way, 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 that was about his time way long ago or something like that. And we don't see journey. I see it within his journey. Okay? Uh, so then he says, if then I do what I will not to do, this is where some people get, this is where it gets a little Dr. Susie. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that is good. Okay, let me try to say this in a helpful way. When you do what you don't want to do, what happens is, okay, let's say you land in that place. The trail of your actions goes back to you are basing it on the law. The law led you there. See, we don't think that way. We think, no, nah, sin, I got to get a demon out of me. Oh, it's, you know, sin, demon, sure, okay, got all that. But he's he's saying when you're landing in that place, you're, let's get to your heart. Your heart is saying the law is good. And, and to put it in modern terminology, perfectionism and performance, you're saying that's good. We got to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The way that I, you know, I put that effort in, I do that good stuff, and I pray this way, and I read my Bible this way, and I do these things. That puts me there. That's my value for my spiritual standing with God. 
I say the law is good. It's my core value. It's my reliance. My foundation is the law. Do you find yourself doing what you don't want to do? I would propose to you that somewhere within your life, the law is actually having a driving force. But we're not taught that. Then Paul goes even deeper. You're going to now get some deeper discernment, some freedom. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. This is interesting. He says this statement twice here. So that means it's important. He says, when I have the mindset of the flesh, the old me, it ties to the law. It arouses sin. Sin manifests. Sin takes over. And it's not me doing it. It's sin happening. He's creating this lens of separating out who he is and who who he's not. This is very, very important. Now, when you read this word sin, there are typically, there's like three or four words that are used when we talk about sin. There's the, the word sin as a verb, missing the mark. Now, if you go into the Old Testament, you'll see the word iniquity being used as the sin that travels in generations. David said, in iniquity, I was conceived. Okay, this is the seed of sin that travels in the generations through the old you, unregenerated, uh, uh, separated to God, but trying to be good, right? Um. In the work of the work of sin is at work there. We can use words like transgressions, things like that. that. That could be other other extensions and understanding. But here in this passage, he refers to sin as a noun. Now, this is very strange. You might even get a, a, a little supernatural, maybe a little woo woo for people. Some people go, "Ooh, what are you talking about here?" It's like he's talking about a presence or a being in him, but it's not him. Could this be the work of Satan's kingdom perpetuating the work of sin in the old you as as a work of the law? Because Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and how can he accuse you, condemn you? He needs the law to do it. Right? He needs the cycle to continue to keep you bound. I I hope you're I hope you're with me so far, because I know I'm taking taking a deep dive in this, right? Now, we could look at the biblical definition of what is sin, and it would exhaust most people. It would wear them out. If you you have a law-based lens, the definition of sin will wear you out. uh, 1 John 3, 4 tells us that all sin is lawlessness without any guide, right? Just do whatever you want. There's no grit at all, right? John also says in 1 John 5, 17, all sin is unrighteousness. Anything that's not of righteousness. Paul takes it even another step further in Romans 14, 23, says whatever is not of faith is sin. So basically, whatever thought, pattern, belief, and behavior that's not of God is of the ways of sin. If you look at that through a law lens, you're exhausted, you're disqualified, you're discouraged, you're worn out, because that's what the law does. It wears you out. We need something new to give us Redemption and our new focus. And part of it starts with Paul saying, this isn't even me. This whole thing that's in operation, it's not even me. Now, keep in mind, temptation is not sin. A thought showing up is not sin. Even if it creates a feeling, it's not sin. We also need to make a distinction because the Bible talks a lot about the dangers. And there are dangerous people that infiltrate the flock. And they are people who practice sin as a way of life. They promote it, and they encourage others to be involved in it too. And the apostles had to take strong stances of it, because these people were infectious in uh, pulling people astray. Okay, my goal is not to get into that dive. That's a whole subject in its own. What Paul is saying here is when this stuff happens— it's not me. Whatever you struggle with, it's not you. 
More on that in just a moment. Verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh. Well, that's an interesting distinction. In the old me, nothing good dwells. So I'm not going to try to rely on that. I'm not going to try to prop myself up, do good, be better. I'm going to die to that because there's nothing good there. Okay? It's depraved. It's filled with sin. And it, it's self-righteous. On its best day, it's self-righteous. And that's of sin too. So let's just let it go. He says, even to will is present with me, but how to do it, I cannot find. So he goes, I have a desire within me to do good. But how to do it, in that place, I can't find it. In that old me, in that flesh place, I, I just can't. I can't. And it's a, I think it's a healthy place for us as believers to realize that in the old you, there's nothing good there. So stop trying to stand on that. I'm a good person. I do good. I pay my taxes. I do good things. I read my Bible every day. Because Paul says, I can't even find the how there. I have a, I have a desire for good. And I believe that as believers, we have a desire for good. And, and I believe even in humanity, there is within humanity an inward desire towards good. And the conscience pulls on that. I had a little teaching on the conscience. That was meant to lead us to Jesus Christ, our need for Jesus Christ. And so, but what mankind does, and this is a work of the flesh, is we seek to find it through the mindset of the law, I'm a good person, these rules and these, these things. And that's what I'm saying over and over again. We're learning to die to. So he says, for the good that I will to do, he's repeating himself. This means it's important. The good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, how many of you relate to that? Raise your hand. So the struggle, if you relate to that, it's revealing the struggle of the influence of the law is at work. This is why detoxing the law is so important. So he says, now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So a key number two, the first one that I brought about is dying to the old you that is tied to the law. Key number two on the journey of condemnation to grace is separating out who you are in Christ, and understanding what is not you. So, for example, in my journey, I realized, now this, this condemns many believers, they go into shame and they spiral. When I read, whatever is not of faith is sin, something clicked in me one day. I'd read it before. It dawned on me, fear is, is, is of sin. This isn't of God. Now, most people go, oh, it's sin. I got I to gotta repent and apologize because I felt anxious today. No, no, no. They go into that condemnation cycle. I was awakened. And I go, this isn't me. This isn't me. God didn't make me to be an anxious, panic-filled person. I don't have to be condemned in it that I'm struggling and I'm not going to use the law to go, well, let me do better, let me do better, try, try harder, try harder, try harder. Because if I'm not condemned, then I can actually see this battle through God's lens perspective, and I get illuminated of what's really going on. See, most, most uh, Christians can't get free because they never get the chance to see what's going on in their heart and life because they are filled with condemnation. Condemnation doesn't let you see it. You're just, the shame of it is, is I even call them shame attacks. It's, it's like you're drowning. You can't even see, you can't even see what's in the water because you're just drowning. When you take condemnation off, you see it soberly and God will help you get to the heart of what's happening through a journey. So this anxiety is not of God. Now, I don't have to hate myself for struggling. That's going to bring me back to law-based thinking. Okay. Now, what condemnation does is it causes you to see yourself as one with your battles. Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't just have this struggle. You are that struggle. And the more you get locked into that, the more you see yourself in that identity. And identity drives everything. How you see yourself is how you live. 
but you see yourself as a shameful, rotten, terrible, awful person. What you're doing is you're looking at yourself through the flesh, the old you. You're not seeing yourself in the new you, because if you see yourself in the new you, you rejoice in gratitude. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, God. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. This is incredible. What a beautiful treasure that you've put in an earthen vessel that you've given me. And yes, there are battles, but without condemnation, you see them in divine perspective. You see God's healing work, and he'll help you get to the heart of that battle to lead you into greater freedom. Now, when Paul makes this statement, he's not advocating responsibility. You know how some people are like, the devil made me do it, right? And, and, and what they're doing is they're pushing away responsibility. No, he's not pushing away responsibility. He's recognizing what's at work, and he's seeing it through a non-condemning lens, because where we're going is a no-condemnation zone. That's where he's being led to. Okay? Verse 21, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. No, I want to do good, don't you? He says, I, for I delight in the law, according to the inward man. Now, I personally believe, and this is where sometimes we got to pay attention to words. When he says law of God, I don't believe he's saying the law, the Old Testament law. He's talking about the ways of God, right? It's kind of a little bit of a, a, a shift here. He's like, I, I delight according to the inward man, okay? That's That's been renewed. I'm a new person now, and I'm on a journey of getting to know that. Do you know that you're on a journey of getting to know God, your father, but getting to know the real you? the new you, right? Happened in a moment in a prayer, but you're spending your life getting to know that. I'm getting to know the new Mark. He has a new name, a new identity, a new destiny, a whole new spiritual DNA. I'm on my journey of discovering that, that inward man that's taking place. Okay, so just... just helping to bring some clarity to that. He says, but I see another law, another way in my members, warring against the law, the way of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, I'm going to insert this in this moment. I could have mentioned it earlier, but I'll, I'll mention it here. I think that what I appreciate so much here, and this is key number three, is just being honest about your struggle without shame. Listen to him here. He's just being so honest about his journey. And this guy is Apostle Paul. Okay? This isn't just, you know, some guy in the church that doesn't have any authority influence. It's a person of high-level influence. We hold them in high esteem and, 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 and appreciate of his work as a work of the Holy Spirit. But he's honest. And I think when you when you get free from condemnation, you see your battles the way you need to see them. So you're not trying to live your life to present something you're not. You're not trying, and, and, and so much of that is in our world. You see yourself in journey, and you see God's heart and his perspective, because when you're under condemnation, you get distracted. Oh, I got to fix this. 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 And God's like, yeah, I know about all of that and a hundred and a thousand other areas. Here's what I'm working on over here. And a lot of it's simple, fundamental things. Growing in layer, layer, layer by layer. The beauty that's here in this authenticity. I can't emphasize that enough. So he says, I, 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 I see this, this tension, these two mindsets, right? And the sin... Which, which the, the sin, which is aroused by law, and the law is aroused uh, in connection to the flesh, the old you. These, this, this is all working in operation. There's a new me, which the basis is now righteousness in Jesus Christ, giving me a new me, a new identity. So now my focus is the beauty of his righteousness, producing fruit of the Spirit, which is relational. So he's not condemning me. He's not holding sin over my head. 
He's not holding anything over my head. Because that's what condemnation does. It's like God's sitting there in like resentment over you. He's patient, he's kind, he's gentle, and he walks with me in the journey. So now, Paul seeing this battle, he's in his honest expression, and he comes to this epic level of, oh my goodness, with all this stuff. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Because that's where it's leading him to. That word wretched, it means miserable, just distressed. How how many of you felt that in your journey? Just miserable, and I'm just distressed. That's what the old you, the law, and then the manifestation of sin does. It's just, and then we're condemned in it, right? And so law-based people reading this passage of Scripture would go, okay, so give me the three steps. And he doesn't. He doesn't give you the three steps. He gives you the thing that you actually need, but you don't think, you don't necessarily know that you need it. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that he came to deliver me. So then, with the mind, I serve the law of God. With the flesh, the law of sin. So the mind a renewed mind, I'm, I'm serving the ways of God, the old me is going to get trapped into sin, but the old me gets trapped into sin through law-based living. This is primary mechanism, okay? So he says, I thank God, and this is where grace is now coming into. Now, so uh, let's talk, about, let, let me just review this, okay? The mindset of the flesh points to the law, performance and perfectionism. The focus is Sin prevention, you know, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And what happens? Sin happens. Remember, the flesh doesn't lead you directly to sin. It, its primary method is to lead you to the law, which then brings out sin. This three-step process, flesh, law, sin, flesh, law, sin. Get this understanding. Old you, performance, perfectionism, sin. Sin happens, and then what? You're condemned, bam, because you violated the law, you couldn't do it, so the accuser of the brethren comes in and hammers you over, hammers you over, hammers you. Shame, toxic guilt, accusation. Shame, toxic guilt, accusation. So in that state, what do you do? I got to do better. I got to do better. God, I'm so sorry. And you notice in that, you ask for forgiveness, you even repent. But it's just like, still feel bound, don't you? Because what are we doing? What, what, what have I not mentioned at all? Love and grace. It's nowhere found in this, is there? God embracing you, hugging you, in every mess up and every struggle and everything, he's here embracing you, Showing you how much how much you're loved, everything in you, because because condemnation's got the megaphone, so it goes. It can't, it can't, it can't. And the idea of someone loving you, it seems like to many law followers, it seems like compromise. Can't be true. It's too good to be true. So in that condemnation, what's the solution? Do better, do more. You go back and you repeat it again. The mindset of the Spirit. So if our minds move into, I'm going to, the mindset of the Spirit. I died of the law. That's not my framework anymore. It's not about the rules and getting all the rules down today. This is Jesus Christ paid it all for me, and I'm going to learn how to relate to him because I have access to the Father now by faith. I'm a new creation I stand with that righteousness, and now I'm going to grow in that righteousness. What's that called? Sanctification. I'm going to grow in that on a daily basis, layer by layer. And I'm going to pay attention to that work because I'm living from a place of responding to what I receive. That's the mindset of the Spirit that Paul's bringing. So what he brings as the solution, drum roll, please, 8-1, Romans 8-1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, 
but according to the Spirit. So this journey is going to involve recognizing, key number four, that condemnation towards God's children is not of God. Not of God. Not of God. Let me break this passage down in a way that is not taught, and it I got to be honest, it upsets me the way this is taught, because I hear preachers do this. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, right? And then they go, but don't make sure you finish the sentence. And they'll say, to those who walk according to the not uh, to, to who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And the way that they define flesh and spirit is, the flesh does bad things, spirit does good things. See, I sinned. Oh, you're in the flesh. Okay, so then you're condemned. So if I go by that metric, everyone is condemned. Christians and non-Christians alike, we're all condemned. You see the way we teach flesh and spirit? I hear this all the time. Pentecostals do it a lot too. We're trying to do this in the flesh, and we got to do this in the spirit. It's like, what does that even mean? What they're saying is, bad person, bad person, you got to be in the spirit. Good person, good person. Oh, you pray a lot. That's the spirit. You do this a lot. Wait a second. Two people could be praying. One person's trying to get God's attention by, by, by law and performance and trying to pray enough and pray more. And the other one's just standing in faith and just, God, you're here. You love me, and I'm coming before you and talking to you. Two different mindsets, right? This passage of Scripture, it validates where I've taken you, the flesh being the old you tied to the law. He says there's no condemnation because you're in Christ. You don't walk according to the flesh because if you walk to the flesh, the old you, it's going to point you to be a good boy, do the performance perfectionism. It's going to lead you to being condemned because you're going to sin and fail in that. He says that metric, die to it. In this new one, there is no condemnation. You've been made righteous before God. No more accusation over your life. Now you're going to grow christ focus because what you focus on grows, and the focus of your life is now going to be the beauty of who he is, not how sappy and terrible you are. It's the beauty of who he is, and you're brought up to him and therefore transformed by the image of glory that you see. And some of you, I hope, some of you are people of the Word. Hopefully, other scriptures are now falling into place, trickling in as you're understanding this. So, God does not condemn you in order to teach you. He doesn't use it. When you you live, when you manifest sin, there's usually an influence of the law that's there trying to keep you trapped in that cycle. Condemnation comes to your door. So, if you feel condemned, the first thing you should do is go, where am I trying to live in performance? See, we don't do this. Where am I trying to do things just right? And I'm living under the pressure of that that can never be fulfilled. And I actually need to go to God, you unconditionally love me. And Jesus Christ, you gave me a gift of righteousness. I want to be renewed in that. You can't see yourself the way God sees you when condemnation's in the picture. Okay? So many of you are getting out of that sin and condemnation cycle that leads you to, I'll never do it again. I'm going to try harder and try harder, and you fall into it, right? You start by learning right now. You want to make the change in your journey? Start by learning to be loved by the Father through the work of Jesus Christ, saying yes to Jesus Christ, the grace that leads you to righteousness in him and being loved by the Father. This opens up the work of grace, his empowerment starting to work in your life. So God says, you got a new foundation, new father, new family, new identity, new standard of righteousness now. I've given it to you. Now learn to live it by growing that in your life. That's the work of grace. It's going to grow that awareness of Jesus Christ in your life. So the focus of your journey is not sin obsessed. I got to make sure I don't do it. Make sure I don't do it. That's going going to lead you to more bondage again. What you focus on grows. And many of you are moving from sin management focused. That's what you do. Got to make sure, got to clean. You're, many of you are, are uh, like I've been, obsessively, perfectionistically trying to clean yourself up. 
on a regular basis, trying to fix this, trying to fix that, trying to fix this. And what are you, what are you not seeing? Unconditional, beautiful love of the Father, grace of Jesus Christ. You're over here trying to fix all these areas. And that's leading you to the old you. Dead end. So when you're focused on Christ, you're reminded of who you are, and out of identity, things change. So many of us need an identity shift. So in this journey now, when you're made aware of sin, you're not having panic attacks, shame attacks. You see it soberly. When you think think soberly, it's now helpful. I find new mark, repentance gets excited. I go, God, thank you for that. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Wow, that's freedom. I sense freedom, newness. It's not this kind of thing. You recognize even your battles. Okay, that's not me. And God, you're working on this. Thank you. You're going to help me get to the heart of this. Help me to see it. Because the shame, toxic guilt, they're no longer uh, my driving forces. And now I can see the heart. Because many of you, in your, in your anger battle, you need to see the heart of why you're angry. And a lot of it goes back to your history. Many of you in your panic struggles or in your obsessive struggles, you, you got to get to the heart of that. But it's going to take time. It's going to take a no condemnation lens. In your sexual lust battles or whatever other battles that you have in your journey, you got to get to the heart of it. And we, when we're condemnation free, now we see it. And God will renew some things. Maybe He'll renew some memories in your life, stuff that happened to you. Maybe some traumas that um, that that got infused, uh, patterns of thinking that need to be transformed. That you need to turn from and develop new patterns of relating. But you can't do that under shame. You can't do that under condemnation. So I say to you, walk in this freedom. And do not let this liberty get stolen. And this is what Paul preached, that don't get tangled by the yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage was the slavery of law-based thinking and living. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. just, Just highlighting this here. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. You see this law-flesh tie? Law-flesh, law-flesh, law-flesh. Law old you, performance old you. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now this is where the word flesh shifts, change. We're human being looking like us, okay? He walked amongst us. On account of sin, he con- he condemned sin in the flesh so that you're not condemned, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh. I don't walk according to the old me tied to the law, which then manifests sin. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. All those things I talked about. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. It does. Many people interpret this to mean things of the spirit. I got to be spiritual. Okay, I got to pray a lot. I got to do a lot. They're, they're like still doing law stuff. Things of the spirit bring freedom. Jesus paid it for you. Step into it. Righteousness is on you. Step into it. Live in it. No, he's not nagging you. He's loving you through it. Fruit of the spirit. Fruit of the spirit. Fruit of the spirit. And by the way, that pathway will set you free from so many areas of sin that you tried over and over and over and over and over again. Okay. For to be carnally, I'm going to go a little bit further here. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. See? The old me can't please him. So I give it up. I die to it. And he even says here, for those of you that have OCD... He's like, you're not in the flesh. You're like, oh, am I? You're in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his 
spirit who dwells in you. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you to something that changed my life. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything to live according to the flesh. But if you live, if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. <laughs> Again, the flesh is going to try to, I'm going to try to be a good person. I'm going to try to be a good person. Nah, it's not going to work. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live for as many. This is it right here. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. This is your identity now. You're not slaves anymore. Slaves live in law. You're sons. Slaves live performance and perfectionism. Slaves don't have connection to the Father. Slaves don't have security. Their only connection is to do. They serve tables, they clean, they do things. They don't have connection to the family. Sons are now in the family, connected to the Father. You sit at the table freely. It is an honor now. And this now gets into what I teach on in my material on the root of rejection. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. That's why I teach my brothers and sisters, in this out-of-condemnation experience, you need to learn to get rooted in the Father's love for you. Get rooted in what it means to relate to him as dad, that word Abba, speaking of daddy, that intimate expression of connection. Because there is a spirit that wants to get you in fear. Condemnation wants to hit you, and rejection wants to hit you. It's a spirit that, another translation says, makes you a slave to fear. But the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're what? We're children of God. And if we're children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, we may be glorified together. Now, he gets into suffering from here. I won't get into that passage of Scripture. But God, I pray in this 90-minute dive in Romans 7 leading into Romans 8, you'd set us free from this work of condemnation. Set us free from this work of condemnation. Step in. I'm going to die to the old mark and trying to do better and trying to do it just right, but never enough. And I pray that more grace will be opened up, more freedom will be opened up like never before. And I thank you for this opportunity. Set your people free. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If this was a blessing to your life, and I know it will be to many because I know it has been for me, could would you do me a favor, like, subscribe? Would you share this with your friends? If it's been a blessing to you, and consider a one-time donation to help support the ministry work. It could be a one-time or it could be a recurring, maybe monthly donation. That'd be a blessing as well, too. But it's an honor to be your brother from another mother to continue this series on grace because I want to see you set free and live in the capacity and potential that's over your life to experience more healing and freedom. Lord will on the creek, don't rise. This is your brother from another mother saying, I'll be back with more insights for your healing and freedom journey. But in the meantime, I'm out.